are so different from ourselves. And there are many things that we can relate to. And I pray that even as we study tonight, you would be glorified in how we declare your greatness and how we see the fact that every single one of these people needed Jesus Christ. That's who they needed. They had different ways of coping with life, but Jesus Christ was what they needed. And I pray you'd encourage each and every person here tonight for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're just going to pick right up in Acts chapter 16 and continue from where we were this morning. And the first one that we're picking up on is the demon possessed. She was the abused Christian, you might say. And today our churches are full of abused people. And it can be abuse that they had from being a child, abuse from a difficult marriage, uh, a verbal abuse. There can even be some abuse at work. But the reality is uh, the longer and longer I've preached and got to know people, the more and more people I've found out have been abused. And just statistically, one in three women are abused by the time they're in their 20s or 30s. And so it's, it's very, very common, but it's a subject that's very, very difficult to work through. But what once we see here is that this is a type of person that's going to be in the Philippi church as well. So we'll pick up in verse 16. Acts 16, 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, so this is now another time that's another day, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, the, now, side note, did you notice what I just said? She followed Paul and what? No. Us. Guess who's with Paul and Silas right now? Luke, I, and I, I wasn't even going to mention that that much, but Luke is actually with them now in Philippi, and some even think that he was the Macedonian man that was calling them to go to Philippi. He's with them on the journey, and so you have the we and us until chapter 17, and then they separate again. But it says he followed us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, so that's how I know she's demon-possessed, I command you, now here it is, in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Now, Satan is the prince and power of the air is what scripture says, and the ruler of darkness, the father of lies, and he is growing in popularity in our day and age. I don't know if you realize that, but Satanism is a, a huge movement in America, even. In 1969, the Satanist church was established, and it's actually not built on the belief about Satan. It's built on the belief of following every single carnal desire that you have. So basically takes where Christianity says, you know, be careful, recognize that our, our passions are not always right. Don't just go out to your passions. The Satanist church says, live for all it's worth. If you think it, if you want it, do it. It's an untattered pursuit of self. And since then, the Satanic Bible has been written and over a million copies have been sold. And ironically, the guy who established the Satanist church and wrote the Satanist Bible, the picture of him is him holding a giant python. And I'm like... Hmm, is there any coincidence that we're seeing here at all? But actually on June chapters or June 6th of 2006, they had a huge church conference, which if you take the letters, that's 666. And they're just celebrating evil. And I think one of the things that we don't really think about as often because we're in the American church is the reality of demon possession and the reality of Satan's influences in the church. And so we have to be careful as we realize this. And it's possible that when Paul wrote to the Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he might have thought of this girl right here. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. And I want to say one thought quickly about studying into demons and Satan. It's not wise. Um, it says in Scripture, be innocent concerning evil. 
And that's one of the things that Satan is one of those topics and demons are one of those topics that uh, one of my professors at faith, he said, I've never known a person to study deeply into it and not be affected by it. So Christians cannot be possessed by demons, but they can be controlled. They can be in or they can be influenced by demons. And so if you think about it this way, you don't build a house with a bulldozer and you can't find joy or satisfaction in evil or Satan and in studying that. So stay stay away from it. I I did very, very little research on this topic, and the little that I did, it was like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> I'm done. But she's demon-possessed, and she's abused by Satan, first of all. She's abused by Satan. Satan disguised himself as a master of light, and he did this in the woman's life. He seeks to be as close to the truth as possible. And you notice here she's saying the truth, right? What she says is true. Paul and Silas have the gospel for us. Satan always comes close, but the reality is he always comes close in order to deceive. Because if people would say, wait a minute, what she is saying is what they are saying. Maybe they're preaching the same person, but she was controlled by Satan. The reality is demon possession and influence is a real thing, and it can actually be purchased at your local Walmart or Target. You ever heard of the game, the Ouija board? That is something that Christians have messed with and told stories that are terrifying. And it's something that you can buy and it doesn't even, you don't have to be over 18. But only unbelievers can be possessed by demons. No Christians can mess too long without it without being affected. Secondly, she was abused by others. Do you notice it says that she was a slave, right? And what happened when her slave owner said, we're not going to make more money from her? She's gone. They're, they're freaking out because all that they cared about was what she could do for them. And that's the reality. So many people who are abused or sitting in church have been abused by people who said, the only reason I care for you is because of what you can do for me. And there are many today who have never been cared for. Women, children, and some men who have never been loved, and they're in our churches. But here's the cool thing. The third characteristic. She's set free by Christ. She's set free by Jesus Christ. And one of the things that constantly encouraged me as I went through here is every single, the answer to every single one of these people is Jesus Christ. It constantly goes back to this. And so if you think about those who have been abused need to realize that true freedom and love are only found in Christ. And this slave girl was set free in the name of Jesus Christ. He's not the one who came to abuse her, but to save her. He didn't say, what can you do for me? And G Jesus, I think that's one of the reasons why those who are abused find Jesus so compelling is because Jesus didn't say, what can you do for me? But here's what I have done for you. It was unconditional love. And many who have been abused, don't they don't even understand what that's like. Jesus said, I laid down my life for you. And he said to the girl, whom the son sets free, he is what? Free, free indeed. So Christian, I think another thing we learn from this is that your, your history is not a stumbling block to the cause of Christ. And unbelievers are not too far gone for Christ. If you look at this girl, she's demon-possessed, and you, she would be the girl that you would see and you say, she's too far gone. And Jesus said, no, I can still rest in her. I really wish that I could have been in the Church of Philippi on testimony night. Don't you? As they get up, you know, they finally formed a church, and we haven't gotten to all the people in it, but you have testimony night, and the first person to stand up is, is the demon possessed girl. She's like, I'll share my testimony. I was once bound by Satan, doing the works of Satan, abused by all these people. I was dirt poor, and that's why I was submitted to them, and Jesus Christ saved me and gave me eternal life, and I'm so thankful that I have been set free by him. And everyone, you know, we all like the testimonies that are like, I was so bad, I was completely rotten, but Christ saved me. We love those testimonies, don't we? Because it, it just reminds us that God goes so far and so deep. And then Lydia steps up afterwards. And I think in our day and age, what would happen is Lydia would get up and say, well, I don't have as cool of a testimony as her, but I don't think Lydia did that. See, I think Lydia would have shared her testimony and just smiled and with tears in her eyes said, just like my sister, I too was blind in my sins. I too was dead in my trespasses and sins. And Jesus Christ saved me. She had demons, but I 
was controlled by money and simply worship of God. So you think about this. If you have demons that haunt you literally or physically, come to Christ. He alone can set you free. And I, I think there's another reality is that in our own lives, sin begins to control us, don't, doesn't it? And we need to be reminded just from this girl that whom the sun sets free, he is free indeed. One of the verses that came to mind as I was studying her life is, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, let's look at the jailer. The jailer is the blue-collar Christian. The blue-collar Christian, he's your average Joe. He's all of us. <laughs> he, he's just your average Joe. He makes a living. He has a family. And he needs Christ. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Well, we first see him in verse 24. He received the order, put them in the inner prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had, had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and then brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to the jail, or up into his house and set food before them and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let these men go. Oh, we'll stop there. Verse 34. Just the other day, I heard about a man who went to Sailor Bill's. They have a, a corn and steak feed. It's a men's time where they get together and they eat a whole bunch of corn on the cob and steak. And it sounds incredible. <laughs> uh, but anyway, at that, at that uh, event, they have men get up and share their testimony about coming to know Christ as their Savior. And it's powerful to hear the testimony of people. But one of the guys was sharing his testimony um, in a recent, recent group, and Pastor Pat was just sharing it. And he said, I went to that corn feed, and someone got up there and said, I used to be in drugs. I was immoral. I was completely controlled by alcohol. And he just went on through how his life was a complete mess. And he goes, Jesus Christ saved me, and today my life is completely different. And he said, that didn't resonate with me at all. He goes, at that time, I had a wife, a family. I was faithful to her. I was religious, I was making a killing at my job, and my life was at a peak. I didn't feel like I lacked anything. And one of the things that was said was someone else got up, a test, got up and gave a testimony, and they talked about how they were trapped in comfort. And I think today, one of the greatest dangerous dangers for people is prosperity. I think that's one of the greatest threats to the gospel in America is prosperity because it gives a false sense of security. And that was the jailer. He had a good job, a good family, a good income and a good life, but he didn't have Jesus. And it says, you know, Jesus was the one who said, what is the profit of man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? John Piper preached a sermon. He's like, do you really want to live your entire life so you can collect shells when you retire? He's like, what, what's the point of that? That's not, that's not worth living for. This man named Je needed Jesus Christ. And there are three distinguishing characteristics of this self-made man. First of all, they're self-confident. They're self-confident. It says he put them into the prison. Paul and Silas were bloody. They're bruised. They're all beat up. And this guy, that he, he's told, don't lose these guys. And he goes, I know how to do that. I've got an inner prison. And absolutely confident in himself, he put them into the prison. He had zero concern for that for them. And if you're like the jailer, you have an answer for anything, and others don't enter your thoughts as you live life. Isn't that our world today? We have an answer for everything, but others don't enter our thoughts. Like, how, how will what I'm about to do affect other people? 
don't care. He's self-confident. There's another one. He's self-assured. Do you notice in verse 25? It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. And this actually doesn't, th this word is not the word for going, God, please save us from this situation. This is, this is the word of praising. Praising and singing hymns to God and the what? Prisoners were listening to them. What was the guard doing? Sleeping. He's out cold. The prisoners, like, they're like, something's happening. These guys are weird. <laughs> they just got the snot beat out of them. They're in shackles. And the way they're set up is it was supposed to cause major cramping. Uh, what, what Paul and, and Silas were put into, it was supposed to cause major cramping in your legs, back, and arms. So they got the, the pain on their back of being whipped and the pain from cramping. And they're singing these songs and the prisoners are like, there's something going down. <laughs> they're, they're on something. I don't know what it is. And the jailer is sleeping. Paul and Silas had songs in the night, but he was sweet, sleeping and it took an earthquake to wake him up. He's like the fool in Luke 8, 12, 18, who has a really big crop. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tear down my old barns, build bigger barns, collect my crop, and then tell myself, just chill and enjoy your life. Or the fool of James chapter 4. Do you remember? Well, let's go ahead and turn there. James chapter 4. We got time. For this person, and maybe it's for you, God enters their mind, but he has very little effect. So this guy is sleeping. He's expecting it to be like any other day, Paul and Silas, or any other prisoner. And he's out cold, and it takes an earthquake to wake, up, wake him up. James chapter 4. Verse 13, come now you who say today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town, spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. That's what this guy is. He's completely self-assured. And he's like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Do you remember the story of David? Um, after he had slept with Bathsheba, Nathan comes in and tells him a parable about the sheep, right? And the big mic drop line is what? When, when Nathan says to David, you're that man. <laughs> you're that man. I think that if Nathan were here today, he'd walk into a lot of our churches and say, you're that man. You're this man, the jailer, the self-confident, the self-assured, the person who is living for themselves. You're the man. You're the one who is comfortable and self-assured. You're the man. It took an earthquake to shake this guy out of his self-sufficiency. But the earthquake didn't save him, did it? The earthquake didn't give him eternal life. And sometimes it takes a catastrophe to wake up the self-assured. But the reason why... It didn't give him eternal life is because he was still so self-focused. And that's the next point. But as you think about that, it takes a catastrophe to wake up these people. I thought, do we not have that right now? You know, when I preached on December 29th, the first sermon in our series, New Year, New You, it was this year, try to rest more. And COVID did. And I was like, God agrees with me. <laughs> God's like, you want to be busy? You want to be wrapped up in yourself? You want to keep on working for yourself? Here's a pandemic that's going to shut down everything. And sometimes, that, that's why one of the things I'm most excited about COVID-19 is it's making people actually think about eternal life. It's making people actually think about death. It's actually waking many, many people up. Even with the, the restrictions where the government is reaching over and they're saying, nope, don't go to church. You don't get to go to church. We're not going to let you go to church. It's like, okay, we're, we're separating the chaff from the wheat here. It's an earthquake in churches, if you would. It's shaking the church and it's saying, wake up. And we need that. Because like I even shared this morning, you know, some of us need that tender, tender Timothy that just comes alongside of us and says, hey, I see this in your life. And others of us need the two by four. 
But this jailer was self-focused. And he said, I'll kill myself. Because the greatest fear of the self-interested is losing control. I wonder if you fear losing control. Do you fear being out of control, having it all figured out? When he woke up from the earthquake, he said, I'm in control of my own fate. And without any thought to his wife or his kids, he says, I'm going to kill myself. I'm not letting the government do it because at that time, what happened if you lost a prisoner? You got their sentence. So if it was a death sentence, you got it. And really, if you lost one, for the most part, it was a death sentence. He's like, they're not killing me. I'm going to kill him. And the blue-collar Christian can be so tempted to only think about themselves. He's the type of guy who would take death over shame, who would impoverish his family over losing his reputation. Do we have any of those today? Maybe you're like that. It's a dangerous place to be. So how does God reach this type of person? This is what's so cool. How in the world does God reach into this guy? He's, he's, he's got an answer for everything. Earthquake, guy escapes, I'm going to kill myself. Um, I, I'm charged with the super important thing. I'm going to throw him into the inner prison. How does God reach them? With someone who's not self-interested. Because the completely self-focused doesn't understand people who work for others. They're like, okay, well, what's in it for you? And for the most part, even the self-interested, the self-assured, the self-confident, they'll go to church. Why? Because it makes them feel good. I'll go to church. But they just couldn't understand someone who wouldn't act in their own self-interest. Was it in Paul and all the prisoners' self-interest to escape? It was. Can you, can you imagine being in your prison cell? I mean, you wouldn't have a nice chair like this. You're hearing Paul and Silas sing, listening carefully, listening to what they're singing, and an earthquake shakes open your door. And you're like, I'm in here for life. <laughs> I, I'm out of here. And you get to walk, like, what stopped them? Have you ever wondered that? What stopped them? I, I tend to lean towards the, the opinion that Paul did. He's like, no, 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 wait. Paul stopped him. But he acted in the interest of others. Now, how do we know that he's not just still acting in his own interest? Because we'll go back to Acts 16. His response is, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the average person does not want to go to hell. I, I've met very few people that want to go to hell. I have met some. They think hell is a party and it's just a lot of fun. And it's that's where the golf courses are and that's where the prostitutes are. That's what he told me. Like, that's where the prostitutes and the beer is. And so that's where I'm going. But very few people want to go to hell. So how do you how do you distinguish if this guy is just trying to act in self-interest? The reason is, verse 33, he took them that same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once and his family. Then he brought them into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. The presence of Christ in the self-focused person transforms them into a person who cared for others. And so the evidence of Christ in a person who is self-focused is that they begin to be concerned for others. He switches here from, I don't care what you feel like, to let me dress your wounds. Let's not let the rats lick off all the, the blood from your body. Let me give you some food. And his house got saved and he tended Paul and Silas. Warren W. Rears, he says, One of the evidences of true repentance is a loving desire to make restitution and reparation wherever we have hurt others. We should not only wash one another's feet, as Jesus says, but we should also cleanse the wounds that we have given to others. Have you wounded anyone? And have you taken the time to represent Christ and gone back to them and said, I'm sorry for this wound? Have you done what you can to, to repair the wound that you have given to those people? Because that's what he does. I mean, it's possible that he was the man who beat them. And he takes time to tend it. Will the scars still be there for the rest of Paul's life? You bet they will. You can't heal scars, but you can help to heal wounds. And I'll, I'll say, sometimes a, a genuine apology goes a long ways. It really does. It Simple, I was wrong. I did this, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? 
And that doesn't solve everything. And many times there's, there's work that still needs to be done to heal that. But we need to realize that we wounded people and helped them. Let's look at the last one, Paul, the shepherding Christian. Verse 35. Have you ever read this and wondered why Paul didn't say that he was a Roman while he's getting beat? You know, it, I don't know exactly what it looked like, but it's probably, he's down, probably, you know, strapped onto something, and he's getting beat. You would think he'd be like, I'm a Roman! <laughs> Stop it! Why does he wait? But watch what happens. Verse 36, but when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, go to those men. And the jailer reported the words of Paul saying, hey, you're free to go. Therefore, come out and go in peace. And Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. And have thrown us into prison and they do now throw us out secretly. No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid, as they should be, when they heard that they were Roman citizens. For the, So they came, and they apologized to them. I'm so sorry. Please don't tell Rome. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. When they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The shepherding Christian. Every single church needs a shepherding Christian, but not every single shepherding Christian can be a pastor. Because there are standards for a pastor, but a shepherding Christian is someone who cares for the flock. Paul was destined to suffer, and it was part of his calling. But you notice that he's constantly concerned with the needs of others, right? Constantly worried about others, except for who? Who we just studied about last week. John Mark. That's why I tend to lean towards Barnabas. That's why I tend to lean towards Barnabas being right. Because Paul's really concerned for everyone. It's like, except John Mark. But that's that's my personal, personal opinion. But one of the reasons why it encourages me is that it teaches me that God, I can make blunders in ministry and not blunder God's plan. Right? So there are four songs that the shepherding Christian sings. First of all is the song of confidence. Song of Confidence. The shepherding Christian is a confident that God can work in anybody. Paul saw Timothy in this text, and he said God can use him. And the shepherding Christian, is that's the, that's the type of person who encourages you. You just love being around them because they're kind, and they seem to always view the best, see the best in you. And they want to see you grow. The churches were strengthened, the numbers increased, and it brought, brought, brought greater joy to Paul. And if you're this type of person, you love seeing growth in others. You just love it. It's just like addictive. It's like, whoa, they used to be like this, and now they're like this. The second song they sing is the song of concurrence. The shepherding Christian's theme verse is, Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And I think if I was Paul... I would really struggle with wanting to take the gospel back to encourage the churches and not getting to. You know, we saw this morning that, well, let's see, verse, verse 6 through 10, God constantly stops him. He constantly stops him. But Paul concurred with them and he would say, okay, I'm not going to go there, so I'm going to follow you, God. You'd write to the Philippians later, don't think only about your own interests, but also the interests of others. Paul was the type of person who would give up his rights for the good of others. Did you notice that in verse uh, 1 through 5, talking about Timothy, he went and got Timothy circumcised? Okay, what message was he taking to the churches when this happened? From Acts 15. What was the decision that the council had come to? <laughs> that they didn't have to be circumcised. What in the world's happening with Timothy? Do you know what he was doing? He was trying to be sensitive to the Jewish conscience. And the shepherding Christian is one who says, I will give up my rights in order to not offend the weaker brother. They say, I may have a right to do this, but I'm going to give it up because I'm concerned for others. And so he actually... He circumcised Timothy, but he doesn't circumcise Silas. So he was constantly concurring with God, saying, your way is best. He's sensitive personally to the Holy Spirit's leading, and he gives up his rights for others. There's a song of contentment. Song of contentment. 
So when it says in verse 25 that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, um, that was not a God deliver us from this. It was a God we are content in difficulty. And I don't, I don't think if I knew that my life was going to be full of suffering, that it would make suffering any easier. Right? I, I don't think the wounds hurt any less on the back of Paul's back. I don't think the cramps hurt any less. God said, I'm going to save you and you're going to suffer for my sake. And he knew that. But Paul was content in any circumstance. And he would later write to the Philippians and say, I know how to be abased and how to abound. I know how to suffer loss and how to have all things. I want to share with you a song. This was written by Madame Guyon. Is her name Madame Guyon? And it's called Prison Hymn. Verse 1. A little bird I am, shut from the fields of air, and in my cage I sit and sing to him who placed me there, well pleased to be a prisoner, or well pleased a prisoner to be, because my father, it pleaseth thee. Not have I else to do, I sing the whole day long. And he who must, or he who, I'm bad at reading poetry, can you tell? He who most I love to please doth listen to my song. He caught and bound my wandering wing, but still he bends to hear me sing. Thou hast an ear to hear, a heart to love and bless, and though my notes were e'er so rude, thou wouldst not hear the less. Because thou knowest as they fall, that love, sweet love, inspires them all. My cage confines me round, abroad I cannot fly, but though my wing is closely bound, my heart's at liberty. For my prison walls cannot control the flight, the freedom of the soul. I love that line. My prison walls cannot control the flight, the freedom of the soul. Last one. Oh, it's good to soar these bolts and bars above to him whose purpose I adore, whose providence I love. And in thy mighty will to find the joy of freedom of the mind. Or the joy, the freedom of the mind. What she says there basically is, I'm trapped in prison, but you can't trap my soul. If you heard it this morning in our uh, Sunday school, J.D. Greer said this, The way to thrive in hard times is to worship through them, to have joy in Jesus that is greater than the pain of your circumstances. Warren W. Wearsby says, When we are in pain, the midnight hour is not the easiest time for a sacred concert. That's why I said this morning, if Paul was there with me, I think he'd have sung a solo. So, I mean, he just, I would not have been much help, I don't think. But God gives songs in the night. Spurgeon said, Any fool can sing in the day. It's easy to sing when we can read the notes by day, but the skillful singer is he who can sing when there's not a ray of light to read by. Songs of the night only come from God, and they're not in the power of men. So you had a song of confidence, or, and then finally a song of concern. Paul demanded his rights in the end in order to protect the church. That's, that's why he did this. I couldn't understand that. I was like, why didn't, you, why didn't you say this before? But if you think about it, Rome was only concerned for themselves. And it was all about Rome. And Rome, you worship who? Caesar, right? We worship Caesar. That's who we worship. And, and Paul says, I am a Roman citizen. So as he demands his rights, guess what? They're going to be a little bit more careful before they beat another person from church, aren't they? And so he's just still being concerned for the church. And that's what a shepherding Christian does. Paul could have pleaded his Roman citizenship, but I bet that the jailer was really glad he didn't. But the jailer's family was really glad that he didn't plead it early. And the shepherding Christian will take a beating for the sheep, but will execute a beating on anything or anyone who threatens the sheep. And that's, every church needs that. Someone will take a beating, but they guard the sheep. So even as we think about the conclusion... One of the biggest things that jumped out to me is Jesus is the answer for every single one of these people. You notice that? We can't forget that Jesus Christ is the answer to your soul, right? Each of you were saved in different scenarios. Some of us were saved, born and raised in a religious home, right, John? That's, <laughs> that was our life. Did you go to church? Yes, I was drugged to church and I was drugged back. I was in drugs all my life. <laughs> Others, it's like, I didn't know Christ. There was no concern for God at all in my life. But guess what? The person born and raised in the church needs Jesus just as much as the person who's born and raised on the street. We all need Jesus. 
Silas needed Jesus. He was a manly man, needed Jesus. Timothy was tender and timid, needed Jesus. Lydia was rich, she needed Jesus. The demon-possessed girl was poor and abused, she needed Jesus. The jailer was confident in himself, he needed Jesus. Paul was really smart. You know, Paul could quote most of the Bible that you hate reading. <laughs> he memorized the law, but he needed Jesus. So the reminder is, we constantly need to go back to that. Jesus Christ is the one who gives us life. Another thing, and I don't have these up there for you, so I don't have any more points. But one of the encouragements to me is that the most encouraging book in all of Scripture came from this diverse group. I have, the book of Philippians is one of the best books in the Bible. We love it. And you had these people there. What in the world did Lydia and the demon-possessed girl have in common? Jesus. <laughs> That's what they had in common. And Paul is just full of compliments to them. So we have to realize that our diversity is not a hindrance to the cause of Christ. It's actually good. Another thing that jumped out to me, how many of the people in the church of Philippi that we see here were unconverted until this chapter? Pretty much all of them, right? So Lydia is unconverted. Uh, the jailer is unconverted. The demon-possessed girl is unconverted. New converts are essential to the cause of Christ and diversity. New converts, are, that's why I love that our theme verse this year was, He who wins souls is wise. We should make that the theme verse for our, our church. We're wise to look for new believers, and they're important, critical for healthy, growing churches. Another one of the things that I see is that a Christian's fellowship with God is unchangeable. You can't beat it out of them, and you can't lock it out of them. But I think the danger for you is that you can slide out of it. Your fellowship with God can be, it can be hindered. It can't be lost. You can't lose your relationship with God. But the biggest danger for church people is not, you know, a beating right now. It's just apathy. It's what we learned in Sunday school. It's like, okay, I need to read my Bible. Snooze. I should go to church. Snooze. I need to spend time with my family in the word snooze. It's just all these different things that it's really easy to do. But I was so encouraged that even if I end up in prison, prison for preaching the gospel, like I'm doing here today, it's possible in my lifetime I can end up in prison. They can't chain my soul. Right? I uh I think I've shared this with you before. I heard of a pastor, and he was a big, big, burly dude. And he had long hair, tight in a ponytail, and he just looked like a terrorist. I mean, he did. And he goes, every single time I get on a plane, everyone's staring at me, and they're, they're really scared. And TSA asks you the question, do you have any weapons? Right? Well, he's carrying his Bible, so guess what he says? Yes. <laughs> I have a sword. And so they're like, okay. So they pull him aside there. And, and they're constantly pulling him aside, and he goes, but every single time, I get to witness to him. And that's the reality. It may come to the point where we are no longer allowed to meet here freely. You may end up in prison for your faith. They cannot chain your soul. And that's why it's so important that we have a soul relationship with God, not merely a, for, in, or a formal relationship with God. Another thing that stuck out to me is that God is able to overrule the broken body with a singing heart. He's also able to break open the deep prisons with an earthquake. God comes to the defense of his people, both by encouraging them to endure and freeing them from prison. A last thought is that prayer is essential to new believers and healthy churches. Where did the whole church of Philippi start? In a prayer meeting. Prayer meeting is where it began. Prayer really is the thermometer of the church, if you would. Where we begin to say, do we believe that God can do great things? And are we expressing it in our prayer and in the way that we live and honor God?